Brad Miner. Welcome to Homilus. Thanks. It's good to be with you. This is uh, this is great. Um, I uh, I was looking for some books, and I'd I'd gone through some Stephen Mansfield. Um, I had gone through some John Eldridge. I picked up some other books along the way, and then this one pops up. This one in front of me with the misspelled title on the front, um, <laughs> and I I looked at it and I was like, "The Complete Gentleman." I was like, "Oh." But give this one a whirl. And uh, Son of a Gun. That's a great book. It's a great book. Well done. So I reached out to you and, you know, in a, in a hurry. And then I went back and I was like, this book was written in, this book was written in 2004. Like how, how, did, the, how did I never get my hands on this? Uh, what, a, what a cool, cool book. While we're on the title... Can you can you explain can you explain the uh, the title of the book and the spelling of the complete gentleman? Well, it's it's uh, C O M P L E A T, which is a kind of an antique, really Renaissance spelling of the word in English. Uh, and in fact, there was a book written by a guy named Henry Peacham yeah. in the fifteen hundreds yeah. called "The Complete Gentleman." So I just uh, stole his title. He didn't mind. And um, um, because it seemed to me important to use that particular spelling to evoke the, the history. Yeah. And history is really what this is about. The book evokes the history of um, the idea of chivalry, which leads up to the idea of the gentleman and the various individuals throughout history who have contributed to the development of the ideas. So I wanted with the title to evoke that. And I think that that spelling does evoke yes. it. Yes, it sure does. It yeah. sure does. Well, when I grabbed it up um, and I, I quickly, I mean, I'm, I'm a few chapters in and I started getting a hold of some of my buddies and I was like, Hey, you got to get your hands on this book. You got to get your hands on this book. And, you know, typically a lot of the books that we'll exchange with friends, you know, especially on topics like, you know, masculinity, manhood, you know, male development, you know, just becoming the right kind of guy. Uh, typically, they're step-by-step -step programs, you know? I mean, do this, do this, do this, do this, you know, and, and this, this will help you become a better man. And then this one shows up, and I, you dive into it, and it dives deep into the history. It even dives, I was thinking about this this morning, it even dives deep into history that isn't even really history. Like yes. it dives deep into history that's into not myth. history. Yeah, into the myth uh, of of all that that is, and it, just a, but it is a very heady book as well. It's a very heady book on the topic. Well, this wasn't you know seven <laughs> steps to masculinity, or you know one of those kinds of books because for for me, what um, provides an education is in fact education. It's it's the of intellect and history and feeling um, and evoking that, uh, allowing a reader to just dive in, swim in this great sea, mm. you come out and you're fitter and more prepared to think about these things. And in the end, it's really about the individual man thinking it through. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, and I appreciated that part because one of the things that happens, especially with the topic of masculinity, is there's this thing, it's a guy with a beard and an ax you know, in the woods, you know, um, with a beautiful, with a beautiful dame on his arm. And these are the things he does. And these are the things he says, and he's really good at, he's really good at poker. And he, well, like, the, like these are the, we just kind of isolate these characteristics, you know, but what yours does kind of focuses in on, you know, how, how do you become like, here's the grand idea and you can't be all these things. It's the Galahad thing, you know, I mean, you can't be all of these, all of these things, but you can be some of these things. It's not, I think in the book, there's a line. It's not that we will ever achieve all of this, but it always must be strive for. Is that is something along those lines? Yeah. I'm, I, I say that throughout history, I suspect that there were a few men who really achieved completeness in this sense, were perfect chivalrous men like Galahad or Lancelot 
and certainly Lancelot wasn't perfect. Um, but it once was the common aspiration of men to aspire to, to be better than you are, to always be striving to, to achieve the highest possible standard. And as Chesterton said, it doesn't matter how often we fail to achieve an ideal, for then our failures are are fruitful if we continue to aspire to that ideal. If we keep changing our ideals, well, then all our failures are fruitless. Right. It gets us nowhere. So the, the key thing here is to try and understand what a man ought to be, and then to set your sights on being that kind of man. But you know, I happen to be a Roman Catholic Christian, and you know, we, we have the right of confession. Mm. And um, what that right recognizes is that we fail. We fail frequently. Um, Cardinal Newman said that, uh, now St. John Henry Newman, that um, to live is to change, to become perfect is mm. to change, change often. often. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great line. One of the, one of the opening lines... Uh, in the book, and I can't remember, I can't remember who it is by, um, you quoted somebody, and it said something, uh, a man's courage, a man's courage, you'll have to help me with it, a man's courage can never be fully, um, fully understood or fully recognized or fully developed until he's faced death. Yeah, I think that's Jean Henri, the, the French playwright who wrote Beckett. Um, and um, it was the basis for the film Beckett with uh, with um, a Lawrence <laughs> with uh, Peter O'Toole and mm -hmm. um, Richard Burton. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there is a sense in which death looms over the complete gentleman because it, it informs him as uh, the, as you know, there are archetypes that I talk about in the book yeah. chapters devoted to them, the warrior, the lover and the monk. And in each case death is present for the man as he is in a situation in which he must be a warrior. Certainly, we understand that. Monk also makes sense because they are cloistered men and living in a situation where death walks the halls with the monastery. And there are generations of men within the monastery, and there's always a, um, a, a cemetery nearby and you remember constantly in the in the the rites that are followed every day, the holy office, that um, and it's it's like every day's Ash, Ash Wednesday, you know, you know when when you go to church if you're Catholic on Ash Wednesday and they make the sign of the cross on your forehead, they say, remember that you will die, mm -hmm. you are dust and to dust you will return. For the lover, it may not be immediately apparent why death is important, except that for your your wife, for your children, for your community for your nation that you love you have to be willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. i mean chivalry is first and foremost the worldview of fighting men um to separate that from the idea of chivalry and i think from the idea of the gentleman is a mistake now i say in the book that not everybody needs to be a soldier a marine an airman a sailor you don't have to be in the profession of arms you don't have to be a martial artist um but you've got to be willing to know that there are things worth fighting for and be willing and able to fight for them. And that's where that comes in. And again, in any situation, in a combat situation, whether it's intellectual, moral, um, or in fact, a physical confrontation, um, you have to be willing to, to risk. Is this, a very, is this a very popular idea where you live? Where I live? Yeah. Where well, in my house it is. <laughs> If you mean if you mean in the state of New York in the town of Pelham Manor, eh, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Do you think that's a uh, do you think that's a, a common theme or 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 somewhere we're trending to pretty quick that that, that this idea of of going after evil, this idea of of chasing down the evil or t or taking on the evil face to face, you know, standing up and fighting. Uh, do you feel like where we're headed with that is almost almost more just broken passivity, you know, other direction, retreat? Well, passivity is a word that, that um, I think about a lot and, and comes up in the book. And, and actually, as I was making some notes uh, today before our, our call, um, I, I wrote that word down um, because that is a big problem. Um, people 
are so absorbed in this technology, in other technologies. I, I still find it amazing to walk down the streets of Manhattan when I'm, I'm in the big city for meetings um, or just to have lunch with friends, dinner. Uh, how many people you literally bump into now because the phone is up here and, and, and there are so many ways in which our attention is drawn away from the things that matter most, from faith, from, from the situation in which our communities find themselves, from the state of education. Uh, the amount of media in people's lives tend them towards passivity because they think that they can derive their opinions from the news programs. I was very disturbed. Uh, 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 Donald Trump's an interesting man. Um, um, I, I applaud him when he does well. Um, but I find it uh, odd, as many people do, maybe everybody does, some of the things he says. And at one point during, I think it was the campaign in 2016, they, they asked him, what are the sources for his, um, his understanding of, of the world? And he said, I, I watch the shows. Well, you know, okay, there are some pretty good shows to watch, I guess. But um, what I would like a, to think a complete gentleman would do is he would, as you suggested, make a deep dive into yeah. things. There, there are extraordinary books that you can read. There are extraordinary videos that you can watch. My wife and I, uh, we haven't talked about this, what I'm doing these days, but I'm senior editor of The Catholic Thing senior fellow of the Faith and Reason Institute, which is located in Washington, D.C. But one of the things I do with the Catholic thing every day, which is a wonderful website, is I put the art into each, co each column every single day. So 365 days of the year, I'm dropping a piece of art into those columns. Wow. So we're big. I, I refer to, to my wife in me, Sydney, uh, as, as museum rats. And, and we'd go to the Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Modern Art and every museum in the area including the Cloisters, which is in Upper Manhattan, not far from where we live, actually. Uh, we live in Westchester County, but we're close to northern Manhattan, to the Bronx especially. And we go to the Cloisters, which is a reconstructed uh, monastery, med medieval monastery, that has a lot of the medieval and uh, uh, art that, the, that is in the collection of the Museum of, of uh, the uh, Metropolitan Museum. And um, all these museums, feed your imagination. They, 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 again, they're a deep dive into where our culture developed, how we got it, where these ideas come from. And if, and if you have no antecedents, is everything, if everything that you're seeing comes to you through news programs or primetime television, your, your sense of things is shallow. The roots cannot possibly be deep. And one of the things that's essential I think to, to be a complete gentleman is to send your, your personal roots down just as deep as you can, yeah. but to do so with humility, because you know, I'm, uh, there's that famous quote of Mark Twain's that when he was a young man, he thought his father was an idiot. And when he finally himself was an older man, he thought it was amazing how much his father had learned. And um, so, you know, I'm, there, there is that, I'm, but you have to have humility about learning because we never fully plumb the depths of anything. Yeah. Um, uh, but not to try, not to aspire, not to, to see the glories of Western culture. And I, I know there are glories of Eastern culture. There are glories of Muslim culture. There are glories of all sorts. But this is my culture. Mm -hmm. So my responsibility is fundamentally here, just as there are many happy and unhappy family surrounding me. But what's most important is that my family be happy, that my sons could look at me as a model. And um, that's something that is a very important part of this whole discussion, fathers and sons. Um, feminism cannot be allowed to rob us of the importance of showing masculine archetypes and behavior. Um, to our own sons. And if we have daughters, frankly, to show it to them as well. Yeah. It's a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a, um, I have two daughters and it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting thing because, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by some really good Christian men who are rough and tumbly guys who, yeah. 
Yeah. In fact, me and a, me and a handful of them just came back from a, uh, just came back from a, uh, uh, a camp out, which went on this little two day, little two day camp out to where we were testing. We were testing ourselves to see, let's go out into the woods and let's it, we called it our kill cook consume camp out. And so <laughs> take no food. We're going to figure it out when we get out there and we're going to eat, but we don't, but we don't know exactly what. You know, um, <clears throat> going out, going out to that and then coming back and seeing my girls, it was so, so cool because when I walked in, they were so excited to see me, so excited to see me. And, it, and it was, they were like, do you have the pictures? And so I was showing them pictures of animals, you know, <laughs> the way it's skinned out. We're showing them pictures of it. That we made a rotisserie. One guy that was with us really good, just made this rotisserie, you know, over a campfire. I mean, it was just an excellent, just an excellent, but to watch their faces as it's like, ooh, gross. It's between ooh, gross and my hero, you know, yeah. this thing between them. And, and that is so cool for me because the church we go to, I mean, uh, it's a, well, I mean, it's the church I preach at, but there's, there's so many strong men in that church and pushing masculinity has been such a, such a blessing for all the people inside of our church. And that's a hard concept for people to grab a hold of. Is that because of the word toxic masculinity? Because as that thing came out, is it, wh where does all this come from? Where does all the, all the hate towards masculinity come from well i think um obviously the um a certain kind of feminist uh dwells on the notion of patriarchy mm. and um and obviously if, if that's the case in a family or in a society then women are by one interpretation second class citizens um i don't think that's the situation that exists now but even if it were, we are in a perilous situation if men are not able to do the things that men have always been called upon to do, to fight, to hunt, to provide, to shelter, to, to do all the things that it's not that women can't do them for themselves. It's just that the, the roles are strikingly different. Um, it changes. There are many single women bravely ra raising children for whatever reasons uh, they have. But it's also the case that without a strong male figure in the home, there can be great difficulties. Um, people like to, to dispute that, say that that's not the case. But I think it is the case. And I think all the data show that it's the case. And a lot of the crime that we see in inner cities is a consequence of broken homes or homes that never were together in the first place. Um, you know, I, I, there was a football player who, I'm not going to name his name, um, partly because I'm not sure I can remember it, but in any case, he used to play for the Giants, among other professional teams. And he had um, seven different, seven mm. kids from five different mothers, married to none of them. So he's paying a lot of uh, money for child support, which I think he more than once defaulted on. Um, and that that is not a model for for stability and for a culture that is healthy. So masculinity, for better or for worse, but we hope for better, is an essential thing. My most recent column of the Catholic thing on Monday was the third of a set of columns I've done about transsexuals in sports. And that is to say, men saying that they're women competing against women. Right. Which I can, right. I consider to be an obscenity. Yeah. And so do the women athletes now. And it's interesting how, and all of whom are feminist, as perhaps they should be. I understand that. They've had to fight hard through Title IX and other ways to be full participants in sports. It was only, uh, I think, the 2012 Olympics in London where all the sports that men did, at least in track and field, were done by women. So it's taken a long time to get us to the point where competitive women were able to to uh, aspire to do all the things that men do. But you don't want the women to be competing against the men because there'd be no medals for the women. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Yep. And for these transgender individuals, men who came through puberty and got the big jolt of testosterone that you get when that happens, they cannot now, no matter 
what testosterone suppressing drug they take, and they have to because they've got to get their their T levels down to certain you know nanoliters per whatever. Um, and, and, and this is a, one of the paradoxes of the idiocy at the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, because they now require that this be the case, which means they're recommending that athletes take drugs. I mean, they've been fighting for a hundred years to make sure that athletes are clean, and, you know, but now it, it's changed because it's so politically incorrect, you see, to say to the male athlete who wants to compete against women, you can't do that because you're... Your X Y and their X X, and no matter what you say, you can't change that. So th this kind of thing, when it seeps into culture, is is it's at times, frankly, quite terrifying. And a lot of these women who might have said, "Well, men are toxic," now they realize that they're not so toxic when they're able to be side by side with them as brothers and sisters competing together to achieve something important. So I don't know where we are as a culture. I don't know where it's going. At uh, 72 years old, I'm sort of at the point where, well, I'm going to sit back and watch it happen. <laughs> I've been in the fight, you know, and I'm still in the fight in, in many ways, um, but I'm no longer so concerned about where the culture is going just because given what I've been through the last couple of years, um, I, I need to put my feet up a bit. Yeah. Can you uh, can you talk to us? Can you talk to us about about what's been going on with you the last couple of years? You know, I reached out to you in excitement, pure excitement about the book. And then it's, as soon as I did, and I started doing some more homework and some more reading on Brad Meyer. I'm like, oh, my gosh, Jared, what have you done? <laughs> like you just drag this guy out into the into the elements again. Like he's busy. He's obviously got stuff going on. So can you can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I am. Um... I've had, I've had a series of uh, medical issues um, beginning back about uh, 2012. I'm not going to go into all of those, but more recently, um, I, I was working in my garden. I, I'm a rose gardener and I, I've, I've got, you know, beautiful rose gardens front and back. And, um, and I, I kept coughing. And then there was a, you know, I, and frankly, I spit up blood at one point. And so went and saw a pulmonologist who thought I had lung cancer. Now, it turns out I didn't. But along the way, in that same, this is 2017, um, I also developed a, a bump right here on my neck, which um, my skin doctor said, well, that's just a cyst. Gave me the card of a, um, of a plastic surgeon, a cosmetic surgeon, who in the middle of removing it, um, said words you don't want to hear. I won't say what he said, but it was an exclamation with an obscenity. Uh, and he said, it's, it's, it's not a cyst. Comes back from the lab. It's metastatic cancer. Um, so I had surgery at the beginning of 2018 at one of the hospitals in New York City. Uh, and it was discovered to, to be, a, a, as I said, metastatic cancer. They were never able to type it. It's now what's called cancer of unknown primary. So there were metastases here, but they couldn't find any primary cancer anywhere else. Um, and so I had surgery. They removed what they could, took out a bunch of lymph nodes, all of which were clear of cancer, which was good news. And then I went through um, in the early spring of 2018, six weeks of uh, chemotherapy and radiation, seven chemotherapy sessions, 30 radiation sessions. And, um, and the results appeared to, to have been good. And so we were very happy about that. And then um, in 2019, I um, went and saw my urologist and my PSA score was, was jumping up suddenly. And so he sent me for an MRI and it turns out I had prostate cancer. So two cancers and two two consecutive years. And so I, I just at the end of Jan or beginning of January finished radiation treatment plus some surgical procedures prior um, uh, on the prostate cancer. So it's been um, an exhausting and um, difficult period, one that was, however, a good test in the sense that uh, I was never frightened. 
Um, I, I knew, I, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, confession. Um, when I first found out about the catch, the first thing I did is I went to confession because I knew I was going to be up against um, the presence of death in a, in a more concrete way, perhaps, than I've faced it in the past. I've always been aware of it since my father dropped dead at 54 mm-hmm. when I was in my 20s. And, um, but this was a real opportunity to see, was my faith, um, was my life in order in such a way that having lived it fully, I was ready to leave it in peace. And I think I, I was able to discover that that is the case. I am ready. Um, I wrote a piece about the second uh, cancer um, in 19 called On Being Tired. <laughs> and I think that's the thing that I felt most when the second diagnosis came. Just a you know, feeling of exhaustion that I got to go through this again. But going through it, is, um, is what you've got to do. Now, I also said in the very first piece I wrote about it uh, back in uh, 2018, that I'm not, I didn't fight cancer. I'm not fighting cancer. Right. Now, that may seem strange from somebody who believes that the warrior is one of the, but it's just that if, if as I wrote in that column, if, if it could be personified, step outside my body, you know, then I could go to my martial arts training and maybe I'd have a shot against defeating this guy. But it's not the way it is. It's, it's in your body. And what you do is you cooperate with the protocols. You get good doctors. I had the best at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And then you do what they tell you to do. And you modify your life. You, you, you try and eat more healthfully. And this, this would be one message to young men. When you go out in the sun, put on sunblock. Because um, I think that maybe is the genesis of uh, these cancers. It's just that... Uh, because cancer is a complicated disease, it's, we still don't understand it very well, um, but there are lifestyle matters that can affect you, and, um, and it's important to try and modify your exposure to things like too much sun, to the wrong kinds of foods, um, and that will be helpful in preventing cancer. But when the time comes, if you have to face it, just face it squarely, and you do what the doctors tell you to do. It's not much more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah, but, did, did, but I, I have some people. I have talked to people, and I saw people at MSK, the, the hospital, who were frightened. Yeah. In fact, terrified. Uh, I also saw people who were alone. My wife was at my side every step of the way. She went to every single appointment. Um, she waited for me when I was going through the chemo. She sat in the room with me, and um, to go through it alone would have been more difficult. I suspect I would have done it. it. wouldn't have been a problem. And in fact, to every single appointment we've ever had, I've driven. Um, so, you know, there and back. Um, and, and that was helpful for me, you know. Um, anyway. Is it, let, me, let, me, let me jump off for a second. Is, is uh, you driving, is that, is, that a, is that a, does that tie into masculinity on some level? I think it does. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, my, my wife didn't learn to drive until she was 50. So she's, she's very happy when I take the wheel. Um, and she sort of does so only when I'm not around or, or you know, she's going off on her own. So it, that is a part of the way we've defined our marriage. As you know, from as being a married man, you define your marriage in a lot of different ways. And there were things that I do that she doesn't do, things she does that I don't do. She cooks, I clean up. That sort of thing. That division of labor is a part of, of all marriages. It's an ongoing negotiation. Um, so yeah, I, but also I like to drive. And it, it void my spirits. Each I have a nice car. I love to drive my car. And so I, you know, being in the car and driving made me feel good. And I'm I, as I've also said many times, because this comes up a lot, partly because I've had two cancers in two years, uh, so everybody wants to know how I'm doing. Um, it's good to have as much of a normal life as you can when you're going through this. 
And when I was going through it, I'm one of the very, very fortunate ones, Jared. I never felt sick except from the treatment, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and that I understood. And I understood that it wasn't cancer that was making me feel sick. It was being treated for cancer that was making me the radiation, which sort of fried my, my neck when I, when I went through that in, in uh, 2018. And then this past time, you know, you get a little, well, you're just so tired all the time. Um, not immediately after treatments, but then later on in the afternoon, we'd come home if it was a morning treatment and I would uh, take my laptop and stretch out on the bed and work, do the Catholic thing. And I never failed. Uh, there was not a single day where I didn't do my job as senior editor of that site. But then, uh, you know, 15 minutes after I was done, I was asleep yeah. you know, before dinner and then to bed at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, which is not usual for me. Yeah. Was there uh, was there some were there some new spiritual disciplines, um, some n new epiphanies or, or, or theophanies maybe uh, during this time that 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 kind of just struck you or new insights into marriage or even, even yourself as you were going through, as you're going through these different, these different diagnoses and treatments. Well, I know that, um, one of the things I said to friends was that I didn't think I could love my wife more, mm. but I do as a consequence of this for better, or for worse. And, uh, for her, I think it was in some ways, in the process more difficult than for me. You know, it's just my, my attitude about things is different from hers. And, and um, but I'm, a, I'm somewhat claustrophobic. And so at the beginning of the radiation treatments for the neck cancer, you're lying in your back and looking around to see if it's here. I guess it's not, but well, anyway, there's a mask that they snap on your face. And so it's right up here against your, your nose. And, and then the machine spins around you and it comes in close and it goes back and it makes noises. It's not like an MRI with that thump, 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 thump. But, um, so I was taking a, you know, something to relax me for the first few sessions. Then I realized I don't need that because what I was doing both whenever I was getting a PET scan which is the classic diagnostic tool for cancer. And you go into the tube and you go through it on a steady pace or an MRI or whatever it was, I pray. And when I was on the table getting the radiation and the machine spinning around me, I prayed. The first prayer I would give, I would say to the Lord was to give me the strength to be relaxed and get through this. But then, I would pray for others. And that was the, the, the most important thing I could do. The first people I would pray for were the people out there mm -hmm. in the waiting room who were alone, the ones with bandanas on their heads who'd lost all their hair and had lost a lot of weight. And I'd walk in looking like a, a linebacker and people would look at me thinking, he's here for someone else. And so I thought about them and I prayed for them. And I have friends back in Ohio where I grew up and in New York, who are going through difficulties of one sort or another, and I prayed for them. I prayed for the priests at our church. And, um, and I, doing that, remembering to put myself, and this is something that a complete gentleman has to do, you don't put yourself first. You know, It's not exactly I am third, that wonderful Christian construct that comes out in you know, Gail Sayers and, and his interactions with um, Brian Piccolo. Um, they wrote a book called I Am Third and, um, you know, God, others, self. Mm. Well, I'm not even sure I was third on the list of things that, that I was praying for and thinking about. But as uh, you, you, you brought up the Jean-Louis quote that sort of starts the book. Let me take a look at exactly what that, yeah, that please. is. Yeah. Um, Until the day of his death. No man can be sure of his courage. Well, you've got it exactly right. And it is uh, from Beckett. Um, his courage and also his faith. Mm. Um, because I know it, it may sound arrogant and perhaps even false to say that I was never afraid. But I really wasn't. And I'm not afraid now. 
And and if ever I, there's a famous book called The Denial of Death, written by a psychologist named Ernest Becker. It's an interesting book. And his, his thesis basically simply was, we're all terrified of dying. And as we're, that's why we were pessimists all sorts of stuff, because we, we don't want to face the, the truth that we're heading towards an end. Now, you and I believe it's not an end, Correct. But, none, but, but do we really believe it? When you are facing death is when you find out whether you believe it or not. And so my faith has definitely become stronger in the sense that my faith is more confident. Yeah. I'm not worried anymore about whether I'm telling myself fables, whether I'm, I'm, you know, just trying to comfort myself about my anxieties. And I've put so many of my anxieties aside. I sleep better than I used to. You know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd worry about things and think, but and part of it's where I am in my career and, and my age, but, but it's also what I went through. Um, I know what's coming and I'm prepared. You you almost you almost sound you almost sound like you're like you're uh, like you're thankful for it. You you know, you you almost sound like it's uh like it's done something good for you. Like there's like somehow in your in your spiritual development there's been some sort of realization that you know what this stuff comes down the line and somehow through the lens of pain we seem to see the Lord clearer. You know. Indeed, and and our our. Presence in the scheme of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, mind you, uh, I'll add a caveat. I want my faith to deepen. I don't want to have cancer next year. You <laughs> know? Yes. So, uh, because it, it isn't pleasant. You know, there's no nothing about it that's pleasant. Although, and this is sort of an ad for Memorial Sloan Kettering. Boy, I'll tell you what. They come as close as it's possible to making it pleasant to go through it. It's just a fabulous institution. Doctors are great. It's good. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a blessing. It's a blessing anytime your insight about anything deepens. Yeah. And, and I was prepared, you know, because of this book, because of, and that book, this book simply represents what I've believed for a long time. And it helped me to clarify those beliefs and to codify them, not in the sense of the series of laws, but in a thoughtful way about what the history tells us and what it tells us about the evolution of these ideas and then how they apply to the lives we lead now. Um, and um, so I am a freer human being as a result of cancer than I was going into it. Hmm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, it's just, uh, just incredible testimony, incredible testimony. Um, can we dive into the book a little? Sure. Um, the very first chapter opens up with this really cool story of kind of the inception of the idea of this book. And when I, when I, hear, when I hear you tell the story, I think, well, that's like this perfectly blended divine concoction that created this wonderful, this wonderful, you know, uh, seed that grew this book. Uh, now, again, I get a little, I get a little dramatic and and dive into the narrative, uh, pretty thick sometimes. Uh, but when you tell this story about sitting in the theater with your son, watching a film, watching Titanic, even yeah. what's going on in the screen, what's going on in the theater itself, and the the multiple interactions that are going on. There's a lot going on in that theater. I don't want to go to that theater. I don't know. I don't know if that's your normal theater experience, but I don't want to go to the movies with you if that's a normal thing. That's that's a that's a lot going on. Can you tell us that story for the people who have not read? Yeah, this we um, we got to the theater reasonably early and we're sitting in our seats, but there were already some people there, and in fact. They had stayed on, apparently, from an earlier showing. That, at least that's my hypothesis. A group of young people in their 20s, sitting about five or six rows back. We were in the center section. They were on the right, facing the screen. Behind us were a couple of older women. And um, the movie starts. We're watching. Um, you know, it's interesting stuff. I mean, it's, it's visually a stunning film. 
Yeah. There's a lot that's wrong with it in terms of the way it portrays what happened as the Titanic hit the iceberg and sank. But there's a scene in which the actor playing Benjamin Guggenheim, um, a New Yorker, is realized that this ship is going down. And he puts on white tie and comes up to the to the bar area on the ship. And he's and someone says, Mr. Guggenheim, you gotta put on a life jacket. This the ship's about to go down. And he said, Yes. But we're speaking of his manservant who was with him. We're dressed in our best and prepared to go down like gentlemen. He knew what was coming and he was ready to face it. And he also knew, and this is part of the complicated story of Titanic, that there was not enough room in the lifeboats for everybody. And there were a lot of complications with that. But the point is, he was not going to survive. He knew it because he was an, a seasoned man, a man of the world. And he knew that when he hit that water, when that ship went down, if it didn't drown him when it went down, he wasn't going to survive in the icy water. And when he said that, we're dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen, these young people sitting a few rows back laughed. And I thought to myself, why is that funny? I thought it was perhaps the best line in the movie. And it's, it's real, too. It's true. I mean, it was one of the things that James Cameron took from the truth about it, because there were survivors who heard him say it. And so I turned around and I looked back at them. And my eyes locked on with one of the young men. And, I, you know, it's the sort of thing that sends you to confession. But he read it in my eyes, man. I mean, he knew that I thought he was out of line. And so he said to his compadres, well, oh, let's get the hell out of here. I mean, that's literally what he said. Yeah. And a woman behind me tapped me on the shoulder and said, you shamed them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But at that moment, I thought, why does the idea of being a gentleman in, in the way it was just portrayed on the screen seem risible, laughable? And that's what got me tumbling into thinking about it. And I also... I knew slightly, not well, um, a man named Russell Kirk, who uh, wrote a book back in the 1950s called The Conservative Mind. He's one of the founders of the modern American conservative movement, along with my old boss, William F. Buckley Jr. And Russell had said, and repeated it to me at one point, um, that somebody had to write a book about the history of the idea of the gentleman. Huh. And so those things collided for me um, and, and the, the idea of chivalry came a little bit later, but you knew that and as I began to look into Titanic a little bit more, there's some good books about it. Um, there, uh, it was Nellie Taft, the wife of William Howard Taft, who was president at the time. And she was dedicating a, a memorial to the victims of, um, of Titanic and particularly to the men who died. Um, and she used, she referred to chivalry as a part of, of what we had seen acted out on the deck of the Titanic. So then I was just off and running. And um, it doesn't take long for you to realize that you're, you're going you're gonna to travel back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. You know, I, I went back further than that, you know, to Greco-Roman examples that were influential in the Renaissance particularly. And then you, you, you run into characters you never thought you'd run into. I may have heard of Baldessare Castiglione, who wrote a book called The Book of the Courtier, which was one of the first manuals for young men about how to be a gentleman, how to get along in the world. And there were many others. I mean, it was probably the most popular genre uh, throughout the, the, the Renaissance and, and the late Middle Ages, um, because they were passed around constantly. And it was very important to people to... Now, we're talking, mind you, about the wealthy and the powerful. Right. We're talking about a certain class above surf and peon and, and, and even tradesmen. But it wasn't long before these extraordinary thoughts that someone like Leone had. He was a contemporary of Machiavelli, and he's sort of the anti-Machiavelli. Um, um, it wasn't long before these ideas began to filter back throughout the society and influence people. And in large measure, because one of the things you get from earlier periods, back as far as 1100, for instance, are the, the tales of the troubadours 
in, in uh, early medieval France. Stories about Lancelot and Gwain and, and, and the other knights of the round table and Arthur and all of that. And yes, it was, it was fantasy, but it was also profoundly influential because law in the early Middle Ages was ad hoc. You know, it had to do with who the lawyer or the sheriff was, not because of anything that was really codified. And if you were wealthy and power, powerful, you could do pretty much what you wanted. You might face a program from the church. You might from your peers. But nobody was really in a position to stop you. Mm. And so as one of the early writers on chivalry said, it, it mitigated ferocity. Um, and, and chivalry originally just meant men on horseback. You could say... Literally, if guys were rising at the top of the hill and you saw them armed and ready to come down at your castle, yonder is a chivalry, you would say. And here they came. And they were often younger brothers. And their ferocity needed to be mitigated. Because in, in the, the, the Middle uh, Ages system of primogeniture, if you were a younger son, if you didn't go into the priesthood, you were pretty much on your own to figure out how you're going to make it in life. And so they would become what were called knights errant. Yeah. And, and they were the younger brothers, you know, and they're in, in big families, big Catholic families, you know, that were at, at that time. And, and these rich kids were liable to live longer out of, you know, infancy and, and early childhood than than poor people would. And so it was important to come up with a code that could inspire and restrain them. And as I often say, restraint is a big part of this. Because that's the great lost virtue of the 21st century. And it began in the 20th. A little brief and silly story that illustrates it. Before I was married and living in New York, working in the publishing industry, met some people, a guy at the gym, New York Athletic Club, where I was a member. We were talking um, and he said, look, why don't you come to dinner with me and my wife? Um, there's a young woman we'd like you to meet. We've been talking about it, and we're going to be great. So I said, sure. So I arrive after work. I'm in a suit and tie. And she's 45 minutes late. And when she finally comes in, she's in a track suit. Now, this is a blind day. You know, she's meeting me for the first time. She says to our hosts, give me a scotch. They give it to her. She sits down on the couch across from me, and she says, you won't believe what my therapist just told me. Now, that's a sort of classic New York story where, you know, like every third person is in therapy. But um, it also it, it occurred to me later on as I'm working on this book. When there's a, an example of someone who lacked restraint, happened to be a woman in this case. But. Um, that's what we're, you, I know you want to talk later about Sprezzatura, so maybe I won't segue into that now. Yeah, but go ahead. One, okay. Well, Sprezzatura <laughs> is something that Castiglione talked about in the Book of the Courier, and it is this sort of uh, gestalt of qualities in an individual, whereby you're good at this, you're good at that, you're good at a thousand different things, but people don't necessarily know you are. You don't have to scream about it. You don't have to post on Facebook. Oh, well, you won't believe what I just did. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, no, Re that restraint, that gentlemanly decorum is something that's very important. And it's a lot more port important than, than um, people think. I also, in the second edition of the book, um, after the first publisher went out of business, not, not because they published me, I don't think, but in any case, um, <laughs> I, I added a, 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 a note that a young woman who wakes up in the morning next to a stranger may find that she went to bed the night before with an enemy. Restraint calls upon us to negotiate the world as carefully as possible. Not everyone is your friend. Now, part of what I was getting, I think, was a note uh, attached to a part in the original structure of the book about um, instant intimacy. 
you, you meet somebody, and, and you and I went through this. I noted that you called me Mr. Minor as, as we were first um, interacting with one another via email. But you go to parties now, and people come up to you, and they'll say, hey, Brad, how you doing? I read your thing, or whatever. And uh, it's not the, not the best way to approach someone. It's so rampant now that there's no point in getting you know, torqued up about it. But friendship is a negotiation. You're not friends with someone when you first meet them. And so you don't share with them the intimate details of your life. It is a negotiation, and it goes on and on until you get to the point where you're willing to grab a bunch of guys and go out in the woods and, right. and do what you want to do. And then it is one of the great things in life. Friendship is one of the things that how to animate the life of the complete gentleman. But the idea that everybody's your friend or that you're the friend of everybody, that's not, that's not right. So sprezzatura is this quality that allows you to, whatever you're good at doing, whatever you're able to contribute, you do so as quietly as possible. Christ talks about it in, in, in the story of the, the guy who bangs the symbols on his way to give alms in the temple as opposed to the widow who quietly puts her might in, you know, all she has it, 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 to the Lord. We have a president right now who is a problem in this regard, as far as I'm concerned, because I admire him when he does, does well, as he has with judicial appointments, in my opinion. I don't want to get into politics, but the point is, he doesn't really, I mean, he would, I think, be better advised to show some restraint um, to to not let people know what he's thinking all the time the first moment he thinks it. Um, I think that's a mistake. I don't think it matters in his case because something about the freshness of his approach is appealing to people. And uh, unless the Democratic Party can come up with somebody who can really combat that in a rational, measured way, and also, I guess, a charismatic way, because that's a part of politics, well, I think he'll probably be reelected, but it's not serving him well. It's not serving the country well. Yeah, it's a, it's, so a, it's, a it's 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 an important characteristic. As restraint is an important characteristic. Yeah, and it is a, it is on that level. I mean, and on every level for every man, it is a bad example to fire off every single thing that comes through your thick head. You know, I mean, that is a. That's a bad, that's a bad place to be. I love the idea of restraint. Here's what it made me, here's what it made me think of. And I appreciate it so much that you put that in there. One of the things that I've talked to my daughters about is, you know what, you know what, one of the coolest things that can happen. And you, again, you use the word cool, um, in, in trying to find a, a, a modern, a modern yep. word for it. Uh, one of the coolest things is when you can go into a room and uh, it's a dinner party. It's just a, it's just a place you're just hanging out. And nobody knows that you play the piano and nobody knows that you play the guitar and nobody knows that you speak Spanish and you didn't go tell the entire world that you spent time learning these disciplines and then you show up and in the moment that it, it needs to be or it, it, in, in, a, in, a, in a funny way or in a sentimental way, you can, you can pick something up or you can walk by and just play a riff. Like there's something so special about that just in, in holding up the complexity of who you are as an individual versus this billboard lifestyle that we live that like, let me just tell you every single thing that I do and everything I'm good at, because now we are only one dimensional because this, this is all you, this is all we are. You know, I love that. I love that idea. It, it, it brought that, me back uh, to that. I think that uh, one of the nicest compliments that someone can, can pay to a, a man or for that matter to a woman is to say after getting to know them after a time, well, there are depths to you that we didn't know, know about. I, I, I have a little quip in the book about, um, just go off for a little bit about the way people dress. Um, you know, like the woman coming to a, a blind date wearing a tracksuit. Um, I had some dealings when, before I was married and I was spending more money than I should have um, with a, a bespoke tailor in, on Savile Row in London. And um, their, their philosophy was, when you leave our establishment wearing your new suit, when you run into a friend on the street, we don't want him to say, oh, what a beautiful suit. We want him to say, 
you're looking really well. How are you? You know, I mean, things out not to just draw everybody's attention. Subtlety. Restraint. Man, I'm telling you, if you can cultivate that, it's a great blessing. It really is. Not to mention that in business and negotiations, um, if you go in and you say, well, that's what we want. You know, well, OK, no or <laughs> sure. And and then a few months later, when you're having a glass of scotch, the guy says, you know, we, we could have given you twice that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so right. just take your time. You've got to be patient. Things, everything is a negotiation except love. It's a negotiation when you, until you get to love. And then that's when you can be around the people you love without respect. Yeah. That's good, cool, you know. But and, even then, because you love them, there'll be a certain kind of respect. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a certain amount of uh, there's a certain amount of of restraint when you're talking about and the building of a friendship, you know, like that's like that is the best part. Like that's the best part. The people that you let in layer after layer after layer after layer after layer, and then. The reward, the reward is the friendship, you know, and then from there, like then it's so this is who you are. So that's how you think I had you all wrong. Like that's the reward inside of friendship. The, I think yes. part of the problem that we see now is that we're such an instant gratification um, type of people these days. I mean, just I mean, culturally where we are, like if you want it, you can have it right this second, you know, you can have it, whatever it is, you can have it. Amazon will get it to you as quick as you can. We'll get your food to you as fast as you can Just pull up to the window. You know, our internet is, we get the, the fastest internet. You get internet faster than, you know, anyone on the planet. Um, I mean, it's, you can go anywhere whenever you want. And this idea of just slowing everything down, and pulling everything back a little bit is such a is such a rich thing, but it has a whole lot to do with the friendship aspect too. I think this is part of the reason why people are so disappointed with life and so disappointed with relationships is because of their lack of restraint. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I would. I, I think that um, one of the blessings of my life is that um, just before we we started talking, I was texting with one of the guys I grew up with back in Ohio. Uh, our conversations are usually or often about Ohio State football, uh, even though it's, you know, not in season right now. Nonetheless, um, it, it's a it's a fun topic to talk about. And when you've been through stages in life, taking your time, but also cultivating friendship, I'm not a fan of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's you know, he's this is a guy who flew under the American radar. This is a not a good guy, but. He, he, he had the ability to say certain things in a particular way. He said, the only way to have a friend. And so throughout my life, I've kept that in mind long after I abandoned Emerson as a, any kind of role model. And I, I'm sorry I used that phrase. I hate that phrase. <clears throat> but you're not going to be disappointed in a friend if you've taken your time to get to know him. Mm. You're not going to be betrayed by someone who you have been through the fire with yourself and have taken the time to cultivate a friendship over time. Um, and that has to do with relationships between men and women as well. You know, it's sometimes very romantic to see a movie or to hear a story about a couple of people who had a whirlwind, whirlwind romance and ran off to Vegas to get married. But the truth is that they'll probably run off to Vegas to get divorced soon enough or Reno or wherever it is that they go. So, um, you know, it, these things have got to take time and they have to be rooted in honesty and courage and all the things that are what make people good people. And it just takes time. Yeah. It's um, I often I often use the um, the difference between a telescope and a microscope is, you know, a telescope can grab a, an image that's far away and give you some pretty general ideas about it where uh, a microscope is something that it's a smaller thing and you you dive deeper into that into the smaller of the smaller things and that's that's kind of where intimacy really is created is not yeah. just with this big picture idea of well I got a pretty good idea of what the moon is you know 
um, it's either made of cheese or it's got a lot of volcanoes on it. I don't know. I mean, who, who really knows, you know, versus you have a, you have something in front of you that you can dive deep into, you know, and that's where the true relationships really begin to develop. I was thinking about this idea of restraint along with like, what does it take to have restraint? There's got to be, what's the step before the step? This self-discipline of, of what would you, what would you call that? Well, I think it's a series of um, things. It's, it's the kind of training you do, um, the reading, the, the athletic aspects of your life. Teamwork builds trust, and trust is something that is a goal of any friendship, and, and it's certainly something that emerges from friendship. Um, I don't know. It's a good question, Jared. Um, the thing that I think for me, I'll just try and put it into concrete terms. Um, when I finally became more restrained in my life, it started in my thirties as I came to New York and got into business and had some big jobs and was making a lot of money and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> You just realize that you can't say the first thing that comes into your head. If you do, you're stuck with it. The old saying, you never have a second chance to make a first impression. That's one measure of this. But also, you want to do the right thing. And so it's just a stop that develops over time. It's maturity, in a way. My wife is working with a, a marvelous psychologist in New York psychologist on on right now a book about adolescent development uh, my wife is sort of co-authoring and, and editing the book and uh, one of the things that a lot of the research has shown recently is that men mature a lot later now than they used to partly because of passivity as we've talked about because of all the media and other things because not that much is expected of them they don't have chores the way they once did they're not out chopping wood and you know hunting and doing all the things that, you know, a young, a guy 12 years old in 1800, you know, it was a different in terms of maturity than a guy in the year 2000 would be at the same age. Um, now a 12 year old's a, a, a little boy in a way. Then he was, he was on the edge of becoming a man because that's what was demanded of him. And there was no choice of survival and his family's survival depended upon it. Um, but as we go along, as we mature and we get to the point where we suddenly realize I am not going to be buffeted by the things that are out here. I'm not a person who's going to be able to determine reality. I'm not God. I'm not going to, you know, and, and that's another thing that some people think they, you know, they sit back, you know, uh, and I think part of the violence we see sometimes in culture guys, young men who walk in with guns and start shooting up a, a bar or a church or whatever it is, it's because they've been feeling godlike in front of the tiny screen or in the, the video game. You know, everybody in Hollywood wants to tell you that all that stuff you see in video games and in movies doesn't affect young young men, doesn't motivate violence. I believe they're wrong. And and so when you but when you get past that level of passivity, because you are passive, when you're even passive, it feels like you're active if you've got a, a gun and you're spraying bullets. You know, that, that's, that's the easy way out. That's just uh, it, it's surrendering to the worst aspects of your nature and to not knowing the distinction between fantasy and reality. But when you're mature, then I think you begin to realize that you need to slow down. You need to be more temperate in your opinions. I'm not nearly the conservative firebrand I once was. Um, I, my, my beliefs have not changed. You know, my beliefs that went into this book when I started writing it 20 years ago have not changed. But my, my attitude to some extent, my, my emotion in response to all of this definitely has changed. And that's partly because of, you know, the health issues that I've gone through. But it's also a deepening of my faith. The practice of my faith has become ever more important to me. And, you know, I, I don't think people should wait for retirement to hope that, that um, decency is going to catch up to them, mm -hmm. that uh, gentlemanly behavior will, will finally be there because it doesn't need to be. 
my sons, who are to whom this book is dedicated, and um, my older son went to West Point, um, was in the Army, spent a year in Iraq, um, is now married, um, living in Denver, Colorado, so we, we miss him terribly. My younger son is a wine expert and uh, lives in Brooklyn, and but they're both consummate gentlemen. They dress well, they speak clearly, they know who they are. Um, I wish that religion played a larger role in, in their lives than it does, but that seems to be a, an issue with a lot of young people. Uh, and partly because, uh, well, and again, I'm tipping over into politics a little bit, but just the transgender issue that I mentioned that I've been writing about, um, people don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. People feel that, well, and this, this is an interesting segue. John Henry Newman is famous for having written a little essay about the gentleman in his book, The Idea of a University. And one of the, the thing that people quote over and over again is he says, it's practically the definition of a gentleman that he never knowingly causes pain. And, and Newman thought that reasonable, but it's not what he believed exactly. Because if that's all it is, then you're, then you're into the Lord Chesterfield territory. A lot of aphorisms like or Ralph Aldo, Waldo Emerson. And, and of Lord Chesterfield, Samuel Johnson famously said that he taught the manners of a whore, no, the morals of a whore and the manners of a dancing master. Mm. And, and Newman knew, because this is a, a Catholic priest, that there was no blood in this. They're whited sepulchers, that mm. kind of an attitude. Yeah. No, it's got to be much more than that. And as I've said on in many occasions, and part of the reason why the cover of the book has uh, a sword on it, yeah. um, take the sword out of the man's hand, take that that courage and honor, that sense of being willing to drop the gauntlet if that's what's called for. Take that away. If all you're doing is just trying to make people happy. Oh, well, okay, so you're, you're a man, you say you're a woman, okay, then you're a woman. No, you can't do that, yeah. because then it's over. And I'm serious, it's over. If we say, and this is Orwellian stuff, you know, that black is white and yep. good is evil, then we are, to choose the right word, I think, doomed. Yeah. We are, personally yeah. and culturally. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. It, it, it echoes, it echoes a whole lot of stuff that I've heard Jordan Peterson say over the last few years of, you know, a, a lot of those same ideas of, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't start taking words and changing their definitions and saying, this is now what this means and, and assume that the structure that our world is built on with those words is going to remain in place. It's not going to, you know, our structure is built using these words that mean certain things. The minute you take that away, it crumbles underneath us, you know, it That's crumbles right. underneath That's us. Right. Mm. And, and people, you know, they think they're being good by being nice, but nice isn't always good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a cheerful person. It's another thing to go around being agreeable to everybody when yeah. there are so many disagreeable people on this earth. It makes no sense. I got off onto this transgender thing because um, the state just north of us, Connecticut, um, two years in a row uh, in the state girls track and field championships, the former state champion from when she was, I think, a sophomore in high school, lost in consecutive years to boys saying they were girls. And the State Athletic Association said there's nothing we can do. Their preference has to be respected. Now, they are comforting themselves by saying we're wonderful people because mm -hmm. we have acknowledged this person's struggle and we are, we are empowering this person's decisions. Meanwhile, they broke that girl's heart because she should have been the winner. Now, where is the justice in that? Where is the common sense in that? It, 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 it can't be. And I'm happy to say um, that there's a, a nice organization called Save Women Sports that's 
you know, lobbying around the country. And a lot of state legislatures are starting to act and say, no, you can't do this. Yeah. And as we approach the Olympics in July, if there's an Olympics in July, because I know that a lot of people are worried about the coronavirus, maybe they won't happen, but I hope they do. I hope the coronavirus goes away. But a lot of the most competitive women in the world are not going to take this. Mm. You know, right in, in, in um, Rio, there were some competitors, but they didn't make it out of the heats. You know, I mean, they're just not that good. That's they're, they're men who aren't that good. And so that's why they they come over to, exactly. the, to the female side. And so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the strong, as I say in the book, the strongest woman is a lot stronger than the weakest man. Mm-hmm. However, when you look at the overall in athletic competition, that's not, it just doesn't work. You can't have women competing against men. It just makes no sense. And it's also depriving women of victories and joy. And, and, and you know, it, 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 the idea that this is somehow compassion to let these transgender people compete, is it, it's nuts. Not to mention that if you're XY, you can't be XX. I'm sorry. You know, and God forbid that we should ever develop technology that could change that. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking well, of doom. Yes, absolutely right. Well, it's one of the questions that I ask you, which is better, a nice man or an honest man? You know? Um, yeah, well, be an honest man. Yeah. A conversation I, I've, I've had with my daughters, you know, several times, you know, a Listen, which is better? Which is better? I have one daughter who I have one daughter who's I mean, she's she's she is a strong just self-determined individual, you know, out out into the world, you know, kind of plows her own path and does her own thing and and if you kind of fall off on the wayside and you don't want to be friends, she, ah, it's too bad. It's sad. And she'll just keep on. But I've got another one who is a very empathetic and caring soul. And if that thing gets the better of her, you know, she will, she will downshift into nice and, and, and get away from, get away from honest. And it's like, Hey, love, you know, how do you, how do you speak to the people around you? How do you speak to the people around you only with nice things? Why don't you tell the truth? I don't want to hurt people's feelings. Nah, listen, which is better, nice or honest? Nice or honest? She's like, okay. There's always, there's always the option, too, of don't say anything. That's true. That's true. Just move along. Move along. Hey, what can, uh, what can preachers, priests, um, men in general do to ensure that there is a legacy of chivalry in our churches? Um, I mean, our homes, our churches, our communities— uh, what are some things that, that these guys can do? Inspire men to be the kind of men that they should be. To love their wives and their children, to care for them, to be there for them. Um, to be, I hate to evoke the old Boy Scouts because they're, they've mm-hmm. fallen on hard times, but uh, you know, to be morally straight and um, aware of, of the world around them. To be participants, not pass, not passive. Mm. Um, it's difficult. Again, this isn't seven steps to manly behavior. Sure. Uh, you know, it, you've got to you've got to make the deep dive. You have to think it through. So, if you can encourage people to always look deeper, to to make study. See, mm. I, I guess if if you think about the warrior, the lover, and the monk. Warrior is exciting. Warrior appeals to people. Lover is exciting. It appeals to people. Mm -hmm. The monk, not so much. But it's from them that we really get models of restraint and and learning. Mm -hmm. Um, Medieval monasteries were extraordinary places, full of activity. They were experts in agriculture. They developed all sorts of techniques for, for growing things for animal husbandry, all of that stuff. I mean, it all went on. They made great beer. Some of them still do. Uh, they, they organized towns. They built cities. They were themselves, through orders like the Knights Templar, were kind of warriors themselves. I mean, there, Friar Tuck's a fun example, but there were, there were really some pretty serious characters in the Middle Ages. They, they were omnicompetent. 
I interviewed David McCullough, the, the, the great American historian, one time. And we were talking about the omnicompetence of that founding generation. They could build a house. They could write a law. They could, they could, they could plant a garden. They could run a, an estate. They, I mean, you go to, if, if you haven't been to Monticello, Jefferson's house, I mean, you go there. And he was a flawed guy, I mean, a peculiar man in certain ways. Took the Bible, you know, and cut up the New Testament particularly. Took out all the stuff he didn't think Jesus really said. You know, I mean, but, but my goodness, the things that man could do. And, and that kind of dedication to personal development, to thinking things through. But eliminating the parts of Jefferson you don't like, I'll cut him up a little bit. Just take yeah, the good yeah, stuff yeah. and leave out the stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. But because he wasn't so, well... He was loving to his wife. She died prematurely. That was part of his problem. But in any case, his personal relationships after that went downhill. Mm. There are no seven steps, but if you can remember to be restrained, to love the people who are with you, to make contributions in everyday life, quietly, but firmly, to guide your, your children with a strong hand, mm. but a loving hand, um, to, to both, uh, you know, don't spank them, that's my view, hug them, yes, discipline them, yes, because without that, they won't know what's right. I mean, the, the role of parents in the lives of children is something, I was just going back and forth with one of my buddies, and he talked about a young woman who was on the soccer team or the uh, the basketball team of his granddaughter but she didn't attend the championship game because she had a traveling soccer meet to go to and i said what kind of parent lets their child do two sports in a single season it makes no sense to me parents have to intervene or you become like Lori laughlin you know, the woman who, you know, the, was involved in the cheat scandal of mm -hmm. getting her kids yeah. into college by, by lying, frankly, because you think that it's the end that matters, not the process. Right. My kids will be OK. When, when this author that my wife is working with was promoting a, a, an earlier book about being mothers being home with their children um, and, and not necessarily not working. But when they're home, you put everything else aside and your child is your priority. Mm. She was interviewed by a, one of the, the hosts on one of the big morning shows who, before they went on camera, said, I hate your book, a woman. I think I'm a good mother. The woman is involved, this, this host, in a divorce. She's never at home, but she thinks she's a good mother. That's magical thinking about <laughs> reality. Right. In, in, when I was doing martial arts, I'm, I'm not anymore because I'm an old man, but um, the first part of our training Paul Oath was, I will always respect the laws of reality. Mm. And, and you've got to purge magical thinking, you know, unless you're a fantasy novelist, out of your life. You've yeah. got to look things straight in the eye. You've got to see what is the truth. And then you have to cagely figure out how you're going to deal with that reality. People have long accused our friend Baldassar Castiglione of, of being someone who recommended that people lie, that they not show their true selves. Right. Well, that's not true. That's not what it was. But we do need to approach things carefully, faithfully, and lovingly, but also, if you could add in restraint, then I think you're, you're most of the way home. Yeah. I love the use of the word nonchalance in, mm -hmm. throughout the book. Um, yeah. It, it reminds me it reminds me so much of of, of my father uh, as I was growing up uh, and still to this day uh, there'll be times that I'll visit with him and for years he's a great storyteller for years he has told us great stories about his life about things he's things he's done things places he's been um, but just a couple of days ago I was talking to him and he said uh, and I asked him something and he said yeah, that's funny. That reminds me. And he told me a story that I'm 42. Um, he's 60, you know, 60. What is he? 60, 60, 62. And he says, uh, he starts telling me this story and I'm like, 
I've never heard this story. My mother always says about my dad, I love it when everybody comes around and comes to the house because I hear more stories from your dad that I've never heard before, you know? And he really does. He really, he really uh, embodies that, that nonchalance, that, that restraint of having more and more information, just piles of information. And when you say inspire, we need to inspire men to greater things. And we need to inspire men to go out and to love their wives more and to be better parents and to, you know, be more disciplined. That's, uh, that's one of the things that I think about. Uh, that's an, that's an inspiring thing for me. I could use more restraint in my life and, and seeing somebody who operates that way, who always has some new secret, you know, that how did I, I've known you this long, and I, and I never knew this. This is incredible, absolutely incredible. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend, it's a blessing that uh, you have your father at your age. Uh, I haven't since my early 20s. Wow. Uh, he was a World War II guy, and I found out only after he died some of the things he'd done during the war. He'd been sent to the Philippines to be a part of a group of men doing intelligence work, planning the invasion of Japan which of course never happened, but I, he, he was too restrained. You know, I would ask him questions and he would shrug it off because he then made the invasion of Okinawa, which was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. And, yeah. um, mostly Marines, I think, but, but he was in the army and he came in later, but in any case, <clears throat> treasure the time you have with your dad, because, um, I would love, and I used to have dreams. I don't anymore where I would meet my father. I think, probably in heaven. Uh, it was a big open air mall and we'd have ice cream things together and talk. Mm. And I would bring him up to date on what was happening to me. Um, wow. It's a wonderful thing to be able to have your father to talk to. That's and for your, for your granddaughters to know, my son's never met my father. Wow. Nor my wife did she ever meet him. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Well, I appreciate that. This is a uh, this is an excellent interview. I'd love to I'd love to visit with you again sometime uh, on the subject. Let me ask you one final question, and and I'll Sorry. get off here, and I'll let you get back to your uh, get back to your day. What is what is the complete gentleman? What is the complete gentleman? He's the modern chivalrous man. He's a guy who has loyalty, generosity, courtesy, honor, courage restraint. Um, he embodies all those virtues, He's not afraid to fail. Mm. Um, and I think he, you know, because if you're afraid to fail, you know, you'll never manifest any goodness in the world. Um, TK Chesterton said, there are an infinity of ways a man can fall. Only one at which he stands upright. <laughs> and so you want to be upright. You've got to have, and it takes courage to say, when I learned this from, from uh, the president of uh, the first publishing company I worked for, I gave an answer to a question and he said to me, are you sure? I said, no, that's just, that's just a stab. He said, if you don't know, say, I don't know. I realized then that that took more courage than I had. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to give the right answers all the time. So courage plays an important part of it. And, 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 and courage, can, it, it, for me, has come from faith, from knowing Christ and knowing that my eternal destiny is in his hands and I've given myself over to him. Yeah. So what should I be afraid of? That's excellent. So if you can imply that idea, that's it. That's excellent. That's excellent. Brad Miner, thank you so much for being on the Homeless Podcast and taking the time to sit and visit with me for an hour and a half about this. And thank you for the wonderful book. This is excellent. I absolutely love it. I'm going through it for a second time now. Oh, it's, it's perfect. You, you, know where, you know where to reach out. You yeah. know where to reach out. Yeah. Well, thank you. If you don't mind, I will, uh, I will probably reach back out to you again at some point soon. So Very good. Thank you so much. Right. I appreciate it. Bye.